12 men in the landing craft move silently into position. The ML2 course is widely regarded as the most arduous in terms of the sheer amount of time spent operating in harsh environments. A number of enemy Argentine Special Forces units are positioned in various vantage points. A team of 19 mountain leaders are deployed by helicopter and dropped a few clicks away from the OP. May 21st, 1982. The Falklands. The initial landing force consisting of Royal Marines 3 Commando Brigade and 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment sails into San Carlos Water, Falklands. After nightfall, 12 members of the Mountain and Arctic Warfare Cadre, designated as 3 Commando Brigade Recce Troop for the operation, go ashore in a landing craft from the Sir Tristram. The Mountain and Arctic Warfare Cadre in 1982 are direct descendants of the Agnacari Commandos raised in 1942 during the Second World War, and to be specific, it's Cliff Assault Wing. Taken on board the ship before deployment, this picture shows all 36 members of the cadre, all of the mountain leaders, graduates of the brutal ML2 course, a nine-month course in which students progress from Cornwall to Wales to Scotland, the Hebrides, up to three continuous months in Norway before returning for a final long-range patrol exercise in Scotland. Of all arduous specialization courses available in the British military, the ML2 course is widely regarded as the most arduous in terms of the sheer amount of time spent operating in harsh environments, prolonged physical demands put on candidates, and the levels of self-admin, sort of squared awayness, required to get to the end. The 12 men in the landing craft are made up of three sections and move silently into position at Evelyn Hill, Mount Simon and Bull Hill as forward observation posts ahead of the main force. Their 24 remaining colleagues had already gone ashore and are holed up in a house in San Carlos Bay settlement as their headquarters with their commanding officer, Rod Boswell. In the days that follow, multiple recce patrols take place at night and observation posts are manned during the day as the mountain leaders familiarize themselves with the terrain as quickly as they can. They will be expected to act as guides, taking infantry to their starting lines for battalion-sized assaults, feedback details of the terrain to senior commanders, planning operations, man observation posts, and perform reconnaissance and surveillance, well ahead of the main force behind enemy lines, both to warn of any enemy advance and observe enemy forces. These men, with years and years of time training in Norway between them, are exceptionally well prepared for the barren Falklands subarctic climate. Nighttime temperatures dip as low as minus 17 degrees, strong winds making it feel even more severe. Patrols typically cover 15 to 16 kilometers in the dead of night. Unknown to them, a number of enemy Argentine Special Forces units are positioned in various vantage points using powerful binoculars to observe British movements at San Carlos Water. Later identified as Argentine 602 Commando Unit with its motto Vencer o Morir, Victory or Death, on one of their patrols, a mountain and Arctic warfare four-man unit manages to spot an Argentine observation post at Top Malo House without being seen themselves. You know what they say, it takes a thief to catch a thief. You could say, it takes a recce commando to spot another recce commando. The important discovery is immediately fed back to 3 Commando Brigade HQ. 3 Commando Brigade's preparations must remain secret. Brigadier Julian Thompson, commander of 3 Commando Brigade, decides that the Mountain and Arctic Warfare Cadre itself will perform a deliberate action against the position. They have their own mountain leader OP in place who spotted the Argentinian one. The units would need to work very closely together in terms of communication. Introducing a fresh element into the, into the equation would create unnecessary risk, and there is no time to lose. The main force can't move until the enemy OP is removed. With this in mind, a team of 19 mountain leaders are deployed by helicopter and dropped a few clicks away from the OP. 
There is plenty of air activity, so it is hoped the enemy commandos will not be spooked by a helicopter in the distance. This assessment proves wrong. Upon hearing the helicopter in the distance, the Argentinians realize they may have been compromised, but can't be sure. The 14 Argentine commandos stand to and take up a defensive position in the house, prepared to live up to their motto, victory or death. As the 19 mountain leaders approach the enemy stronghold, they split into two groups. Six will form a fire support group, while 13 will do the assault, led by Captain Rod Boswell, commander of the MAWC. While their four-man OP provides up-to-date information about the Argentinians' movements. Because of the time pressure, the attack is scheduled to happen in broad daylight. Unlike the rest of the Royal Marines who are armed with the SLR 7.62 calibre, incidentally pretty much identical to the Argentinians FN FAL, also 7.62, the MAWC are armed with the lower calibre but lighter and shorter AR-15 5.56 assault rifle, better suited to their recce tasking, but a bit underpowered in a set-piece assault on their defensive position. Therefore, they also carry a number of 66mm laws and sort of upgraded version of a bazooka intended to damage the structure the Argentinians are holed up in. The mountain and arctic warfare cadre know that this assault is likely to result in heavy casualties on both sides, which will prove correct. Captain Rod Boswell orders his assault team to fix bayonets and leads the charge against the 13 Argentine commandos. A brutal firefight ensues. After 45 minutes of fierce battle, the Argentinians have only four men left standing at the 13, with two KIA, seven seriously wounded, and they surrender. The MLs have suffered three men wounded, but thankfully no fatalities. The victory comes with huge results. Tactical benefit, enemy observation posts successfully eliminated, strategic benefit, a small body of men influenced the course of an entire campaign as 3 Commander Brigade is now able to approach Mount Kent and its adjoining features to act as a jumping off place for the Brigade's battles for Stanley. Further benefit is that two other 602 Commando posts, aware of the battle and heavy losses suffered by their colleagues, subsequently surrendered to respectively 4-5 Commando and 3 Para, thinking they too would be targeted. The importance of this operation cannot be underestimated. However, Corporal Nigel Devonish, who was part of the assault on Top Mallow House, would later say that this was not yet his proudest moment, which was yet to follow. Twelve days later, the main assault on Mount Harriet is planned to take place by 4-2 Commando to coincide with a divisionary attack by 4-5 Commando on Two Sisters Mountain. 4-5 Commander is the one that had yomped from San Carlos to Douglas Settlement and then Teal Inlet. The mountain leaders are already at Teal Inlet, sending out patrols for recce and surveillance and manning various OPs, watching the flanks of the main force. After nightfall on June 9th, two cadre sections are committed to join 4-2 Kilo Company fighting patrol and then peel off, splitting into two, one over the north ridge and the other peeling south to form observation posts, the first observing Mount Harriet and the second Two Sisters. K Company provides harassing fire which allows the two sections to get into position. In the early hours of June 9th, one OP is set up at Goat Ridge. It turns out the Argentinians are much greater strength than originally thought, 600 men across Mount Harriet and Two Sisters. The MAWC are able to make accurate sketches of the enemy encampments. They also find and sabotage command wires leading to command detonated explosive devices placed by the Argentinians. And they get to within 5 meters on that of enemy position. The unit then proceeds to make it back safely and commanders of 4-2 and 4-5 commando are supplied with accurate sketches which prove vital in the planning of the final battle operation. Meanwhile, other MACW elements act as guides to get troops into position. One mountain leader section takes the Scots Guards to its start line for an attack on Mount Tumbledown. Another takes the Gurkhas to their start line for an attack on Mount William. Due to knowledge of the terrain gathered from all their previous patrols, they are perfectly suited to this task. 
The attacks happen on June 13th. The mountain and Arctic warfare cadre observers are able to call in support fire from artillery supporting the battle. This battle forces the Argentine surrender on the 14th of June, at which point the mountain and Arctic warfare cadre is scattered over Teal, Mount Vernet, Stanley, Goat Ridge, and many of them enjoy their first full night's sleep in a month. Pound for pound, in terms of resources allocated, results achieved with quite literally 36 blokes with their standard kit of weaponry, the impact is massive. This is what Major General Moore, commander of the British Land Forces Falkland Islands, had to say about them in his after action report. The deployment of the Mountain and Arctic Warfare Cadre of 3 Commando Brigade was an unqualified success. Their patrolling, reporting and conduct in action were excellent. Able to deploy up to eight four-man teams and coordinated from Brigade HQ, the cadre was ideally suited to long-range patrolling and information gathering, in which role its performance compared most favourably with some of the Special Forces patrols. End quote. Mountain leaders acting as recce troop are a brigade asset, focused primarily on conventional warfare scenarios. They are not part of Special Forces, which is its own directorate and command structure. In the spirit of healthy rivalry and banter, one Royal Marine told me, the SAS Mountain Troop learned to fight in the mountains. Royal Marine Mountain leaders become the mountain. I think it's apples and pears. Falklands were a reasonably conventional warfare scenario, well suited to Royal Marine Mountain leaders, who as an organization were able to put into practice their decades of hard training and experience. The army benefited for decades from the watershed moment of the SAS explosive storming of the Iranian embassy at Prince's Gate in 1980 in terms of getting public support and resources allocated and competent commanders like De La Belliere and Hector Gullen were able to capitalize on this. Rod Boswell and Julian Thompson are able to drive forward a transformation of the mountain Arctic warfare cadre from a climbing club to a brigade patrol troop, currently SRS, and its implications can be felt even in today's future commando concept. Mountain leaders are the hardest bastards on the face of the earth. I mean, look at their training in this 1985 BBC documentary, which can be found on Royal Marines YouTube channel, link in the description. So that's ML2 course training. Big Jan, my countryman, due to the close cooperation of Royal Marines and Dutch Marines as NATO amphibious assault group, the Dutch get a handful of billets in every ML2 course. I mean, you'd imagine trying to, to hold someone like Big Jan. And they, they did it, but it took six of the buggers to do it. <laughs> uh, and they were using everything. Um, so consequently, we reacted in the same way. It becomes the law of the jungle, really. Do it to others and all that, but do the bugger first, because otherwise you're going to get hurt. And we all got hurt. All of them, all of us. You know, obviously on a course or whatever, someone's got to be in charge of it. They've got to have the rules and that. But we course spirit is a way of, uh, of actually getting back at them without breaking those rules or going against authority. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. A few acknowledgements and shout outs. First off, the BBC documentary Behind Enemy Lines, linked to the playlist on the Royal Marines YouTube channel is in the description. It's a surprisingly detailed look at the ML2 Carter course in 1984, and many of the instructors were part of the MNAWC in the Falklands. The book Mountain Commandos at War in the Falklands by Rod Boswell, the Mountain Cadre Commander, link below. The Unconventional Soldier podcast, particularly their episodes featuring Nigel Devonish, who was in the Battle of Mallow Top House, and other key patrols in the Falklands, link to their channel. Two Royal Marines, not mountain leaders, but able to help me with details on where the MLs fit into the organization and how they've evolved are Jerry Can, and as you can guess, that's an alias, 
who is active on Quora, the online forum, then Stephen Maguire, member of our very own Hard Routine Facebook group page. Link is in the uh, the channel bio. Uh, that group is free to join. Uh, there is a question, so I can do some screening. Topics are outdoor events, training, a bit of military history like this episode, and then following the episodes on endurance. In recent weeks, there's been a more in-depth discussion about the endurance route and, uh, and land navigation in general. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. As always, see you in the hills.